It's time for yours truly, Jimmy Powers, with another Grantland Rice story. Hello there, this is Jimmy Powers. Today we have a treat for every sport fan in America. Not only are we bringing you another exciting chapter of the Grantland Rice story, we're giving you Grantland Rice himself. Down the years, Granny appeared on many radio programs. Many of these broadcasts were preserved for posterity. It is from this collection that we bring you the voice of that late and beloved dean of sports writers, Grantland Rice. This is Granny Rice. Not so fast, Granny. First, let me tell the folks that the first two excerpts were spoken by you at a Notre Dame football rally, where, as your part in the proceedings, you gave tribute to your departed friend, Newt Rockney. What were those two tributes, Granny? One goes like this. Here's to old Rock, to our friend and our pal. He's still the star guy in Valhalla's corral. Wherever he is, on what star of flame, he's still got a team that is winning some game. And the other brief one, just one brief line. We rise to our feet as he hobbles by, a gentleman, unafraid. In 1937, Granny was the guest of Joe Cook, a famed Broadway star. Joe had just asked Granny how long he had been associated with baseball, and Granny said... Well, Joe, I tell you, I was playing baseball at Vanderbilt University when Rube Waddell, the speedball pitcher, was a Detroit rookie. The Rube took a day off from fishing to pitch against us. Uh, did the Rube have much stuff, Grant? I don't know, Joe. I never saw it. <laughs> All I remember is the loud voice the ball made when it hit the catcher's glove and the umpire yelled, Strike three. Uh, Grant, next week, I'm going to have Bob Feller up here. What do you think of that boy as a pitcher? I'll tell you, there's a chance that young Bob Feller might pitch the Cleveland Indians up around the top. You know, this 17-year-old kid has been the biggest sensation baseball ever knew for a starting year. He struck out 17 men in one game during his first month, and that's as good as any pitcher ever did in a big league lifetime. Well, I'll talk that over with Bob next week. You know, I'm anxious to meet him because everybody is raving about the kid and predicting a great future for him. I certainly wish him luck, Joe. I think he's got what it takes to make the pitcher's hall of fame. Well, he's sure to at least make the vestibule anyway. (laughs) But uh, what pitchers would you nominate for your hall of fame, Grant? That's a tough one, Joe. That was Cy Young, who won over 500 ball games, far beyond all others. That was Walter Johnson, certainly one of the greatest that ever lived. Old Barney, the fastest of them all, and a grand guy. That was Grover Cleveland Alexander, who pitched 16 shutouts in one year. A great pitcher with a heart of a dozen lions. All great pitchers, but I think the greatest of them all is a fellow named Christy Matheson of the Giants. Good old Big Six. I guess Matty got that nickname because the batters thought he was throwing six balls at once. So he was a grand guy, wasn't he? None better, Joe. The world lost something fine when Matty died. He was a great pitcher and a great competitor. He was something more than a pitcher. He was one of those rare characters who appealed to the millions because of his clean honesty and undying loyalty to a cause. Here was a ball player with ideals, a ball player who held public faith in dark days when others were trying to destroy this faith. Matheson was above the clamor of the crowd. From the day he first walked upon the field up to his passing, he set his eyes upon a certain goal along the road of honesty, cleanness, service, and loyalty. And nothing could swerve him from this path. 
If it's all right with you, Joe, I'd like to add one final tribute to, uh, to Maddie, just for old time's sake. Well, it's more than all right with me. I like to hear it, Grant. Maddie, somewhere above your dust today, the winds of April sing. The song of old you love to hear, of baseball and of spring. All set to shoot your fate away and trust your luck with faith. Though Wagner took his mighty belt and Frank Chance hugged the plate. I see again old ghosts swarm by from a forgotten day. When Eve was snarled and Tinker fought and Shackard stood at bay. When John McGraw rushed from the bench to call some umpire down. But always called upon Big Six to stop Three Finger Brown. I see once more dim phantoms pass when you and I were young. Before your steel arm lost its speed, before my songs were sung. Joe Wood and Bender, Feist a Plank, Hank Gowdy and DeVore, you still remember from your dust, from days that come no more. Another April comes again, another season starts. New names are in the headlines now, new stars must play their parts. Time moves along, the cast has changed, but some remember still... The Maddie of a bygone day who gave the game its thrill. Yes, a mighty tribute to a great by a great. During the middle 1930s, the comeback trail boasted of such greats as Jimmy Braddock, the Cinderella Man, Helen Wills, Little Miss Poker Face, Lefty Grove, and others. Granny was inspired by these mighty champions of yesterday, so much so that he sat down to his typewriter and wrote the unforgettable verse entitled The Unwhipped, which he gives us now. I have learned something well worthwhile that victory could not bring to wipe the blood from my mouth and smile where no one can see the stain. I can walk head up while my heart is down from the beating that brought its gold. And that means more than a champion crown who is taking the easier road. I have learned something worth far more than victory brings to men. Battered and beaten, bruised and sore, I can still come back again. Crowded back in the hard, tough race, I have found that I have the heart to end the face and train for another start. Winners who wear the laurel wreath Looking for softer ways, watch for my blade as it leaves the sheath, sharpened on rougher days. Trained upon pain and punishment, I've groped my way through the night, but the flag still flies through my battle tent, and I've only begun to fight. A beautiful poem, Granny, and even more inspiring today than when you wrote it. On being interviewed one night on a network show, Granny was asked if he recalled his piece of football verse about Michigan and Yale. And here was his reply. Here's a funny thing. An old friend of mine from Michigan sent me a copy a few days ago. I'd almost forgotten about it, but it goes like this. I remember the stand at Thermopylae the Greek god made one day. I remember the legions that Caesar used to shatter the Gallic sway. And I remember across the years the banners that crowned the test when Yale was king of the conquered east and Michigan ruled the west. At night in my humble den I dream of the glories that used to be, of Hannibal taking the Alpine trail, of Drake on the open sea. And then I wander the ancient ways to a dream that I love best when Yale was king of the conquered east and Michigan ruled the west. And as your final poem on this program, Granny, how about that immortal masterpiece you wrote on Jack Dempsey? When I watch all these fellas maul amid the modern bunch, or when I watch them clinch and grab and everything but punch, my thoughts go back some 16 years, on back to Maumee Bay, when Willard crashed like some great oak upon a July day. A right smash underneath the heart, a left hook to the chin... As Dempsey came on like the safe to slug it out and win. When I watch all these modern mugs collect their easy dough by putting on a clutch and dance, a mugging up the show, my dreams go back along the road to one September night when Shaggy Firepo whirled and threw his high explosive right. 
as Dempsey sailed out through the rope to crawl back in again and stand above a barrack hulk until they counted ten. Yes, take him when his fading legs no longer held the pace. When Tunney pumped his left and right into a battered face, he still had hard enough to charge for one old-time attack and leave the startled champion upon his brawny back. And as I watch them tug and slap, I mean these modern dopes, I see the old Manasseh ghost gliding across the rope. I see him scowl upon his stool. I feel the crowd grow tense. I see him grip his iron fist amid the deep suspense. I hear the lull. I hear the roar. As old time echoes live, I see him charge across the ring to take it and to give. And I'm not looking at the mugs who push around in play. I'm thinking of the fighting man who came to Maumee Bay. And that's one, or perhaps many reasons, why so many people love the writings of Granny Rice. That's why he cut through to people of all ages and creeds. Why, perhaps, he made his love of sport and his philosophy concerning sport such a vital part of the American heritage. Yes, that's why so many waited for these words. This is Granny Rice. And now this is Jimmy Powers transcribed saying, So long for now. <laughs>